Good morning, everybody. I am looking forward to this and our session in a couple of weeks. It's just a good opportunity to take, you know, time to delve a little deeper and learn a little more. Um, you know, as I think I mentioned in my Crossroads article about this series, we are always called to listen to one another's stories. Um, but when we have, uh, you know, a specific time set aside to do so, um, it's good to take advantage of that um, to go you know, just a little bit deeper. All right, so Howard Thurman, we're gonna get to know Howard Thurman a little bit today. Raise your hand if you have read any of Howard Thurman before. About 50%-ish, that's great. So um, just some sort of bio dim demo facts uh, to start with us. He was, uh, Howard Thurman was born um, in 1899 uh, in North Florida very, to very poor parents. He died in San Francisco in 1981. He was a graduate of Morehouse College in 1923 and of Rochester Divinity School just three years later. He was the valedictorian of both of those classes. And in the meantime, um, before he had graduated from seminary, was ordained as a Baptist minister and began to serve a church. Um, so as a very young man. And then he served as Dean of Howard University's chapel for 12 years from 1932 to 1944. And then again, for another 12 years of Boston University's chapel, 1953 to 1965. He was also a student of the Quaker mystic, Rufus Jones, who he credits for a lot of his, his own mysticism and you know his sort of entry into the mystical side of of Christianity. He also studied with Mahatma Gandhi. Um, those were two big influences on his own spiritual life and the way that his own theology took shape. And then he was also a friend and a classmate at Morehouse of Martin King Sr. Um, and so through that relationship, there was a close relationship between Howard Thurman and the King family for a lot of years. And it was through that relationship he became the spiritual mentor to Martin Luther King Jr., as well as to a lot of other names that might be familiar to you. Polly Murray was an Episcopal priest, Jesse Jackson, we've all heard of, Marion Wright Edelman, and a lot of others, especially in the civil rights movement. And he's also well known uh, because in 1944, he founded the Intentionally Interracial Church for the Fellowship of All People in San Francisco, um, because he understood that as I think it was maybe Dr. King who later said 11 o'clock on Sunday morning, it's still the most segregated hour in America, right? Um, he saw that the church was one of the most segregated places um, and his own faith told him that it shouldn't be so. And so this was a church community that was specifically designed to break down those, those barriers of segregation in the church. But before I talk more, I want us to hear from him in his own words. So this is about a four minute clip um, that was uh, recorded near the end of his life interview style, but let's hear from Howard Thurman himself. Oh. University, his name, Howard Thurman. Religious experience is dynamic. It's fluid, it's, it's uh, effervescent, it's yeasty, all, all these words. But the mind can't handle that. So it has to imprison the religious experience in some way, get it bottled up. Then, when it gets quiet enough, it meaning the religious experience, then the mind draws a bead on it and extracts out of this ferment concepts, notions, dogmas, so that the religious experience will make sense to the mind. But meanwhile, the religious experience goes on experiencing. Therefore, whatever creed there is, whatever theology there is, it's always a little out of date. This is why I feel that once a religion 
is stated in terms of dogma or intellections that I perhaps then it can become the source of propaganda it has something that it a handle it can but as long as the, the experience is vital the only way that it can spread is by contagion not by instruction not by addressing the mind but something you catch as you catch the measles for instance that's what i mean when you speak like this are you at one with uh, people who would think this way in all traditions you're not saying oh, yes. a protestant thing no, no it's the nature of religious experience it seems to me whatever kind it is one wall of his office is covered with citations honorary degrees awards and in the middle is a faded photograph of his grandmother who started life as a slave he counts her first among those from whom he took his religious contagion my my grandmother for instance uh, who was a young woman when the civil war was fought and who um, uh, therefore was a slave in North Florida uh, had the responsibility for for taking care of us my father died when I was very small seven years old and my mother became the breadwinner but my grandmother was the anchor person who held us and whenever she observed that I was the water was getting low in my well you know or, or my sister's well she would tell us something out of her past and it was the same story always and and we waited for it she said that when she was a young woman on this plantation once a year or maybe more frequent I don't remember that detail the a slave minister a, ma a minister who was a slave on a neighboring plantation was permitted to have a religious service for the slaves and always, it didn't matter what his subject was, he ended his sermon in the same way. She said he would stand and look at them and he would say, you are not slaves, you are not niggers, you are God's children. And, I, and when my grandmother would say this, we would all wait for that moment because a faraway look would come in our eyes and, and just a slight stiffening of a spine and there was a contagion which which came to us as little children that uh, that the, the the creator of existence also created me and therefore with that sort of backing I could absorb all the violences of life. And Any, yeah, wow, right? Yeah, let's pause here. Any, um, you know, reflections or musings, anything you wanna share or ask or wonder together um, about any of that before we move on? I couldn't hear him all the time. Oh, I'm sorry to hear that. Um, let's have uh, anybody with comments, if you're in the room, to go to this uh, mic over here on the side so that people online can hear. And then if you have a comment online, if you wouldn't mind using the hand raise function and I'll call on you. Um, no? OK. Uh, Carl, you had your hand up. Would you like to share? I know, walking to the mic is uh, makes it less uh, appealing, but I appreciate appreciate it. This way we can in include people at I'm I'm not sure the, com the comment is worth the walk, <laughs> but, but sure. whatever. But I found his image of, of, of getting the essence of religion through contagion rather than through, for example, reading. I, I thought that was brilliant. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, Ginny, please go ahead. It's not 
so much about him, but what exactly does mystic mean? He's in his 80s, used to be Dean. Oh, sorry. Um, well, uh, that's, a, that's a really good question. What does mystic mean? And I think that my sense is that mystics might answer this question differently. Um, that it might look a little different according to the person, according to the mysticism. For Howard Thurman, um, I take it to mean a sort of, he inhabited this sort of transcendent spirituality um, that we'll get into a little bit more as we, um, as we go. Um, but this idea that I think you kind of hear reflected in his story about his grandmother, um, that we are all held by the God of the universe, right? And that when we experience ourselves as grasped by that sort of all-encompassing love in that way, um, and, and to, to know that every other person is also grasped in that same way, there's this sort of transcendent quality. And by that, I mean, transcending sort of the, the boundaries, right? That we um, erect around the portions of our lives Segregation is, of course, one of them. But he has this very transcendent mystical view um, that is, you know, that he um, put out into American culture before it was getting talked about very much. That we are all held by the same God, um, and his activism, uh, his involvement as the sort of uh, spiritual mentor and thought leader for the civil rights movement was a direct outgrowth of this sort of. Um, you know, mystical understanding uh, and, and mystical posture within his own faith. Um, and so that's a little bit, I think, about what it means for him um, to be a mystic. Um, I take mysticism on some level to be a sort of universalizing and transcendent way to occupy one's faith. I hope that helps. Yeah, Tom, go ahead. So I've read Thurman stuff. I've tried to find stuff about Rufus Jones. I'm really curious, how did he practice his mysticism? I have not mm -hmm. found anything that discussed. I mean, I, I understand the experience with his grandmother, but uh, he's a pretty special guy. At that, that story has sustained him throughout his entire practice. So I'm curious how he practiced. If you have any insights or point us in any direction, I would appreciate that. You know, the only insight that I would be able to offer, I think, is that is to sort of reflect what he um, what he encouraged his mentees to do, right? Which was to stay rooted in the spiritual practices of your faith, of community and solitude, of prayer and worship and singing, of silence and meditation and prayer. Um, he was very attentive to um, a sort of, we might call it spiritual hygiene as a way to stay aligned. Um, and so, you know, from what I understand about, about him and about his life is that that was really that sort of going back to fill, going back to the well, right? Going back to fill his cup over and over again with these sort of spiritual hygiene practices are uh, what he did for himself and what he, um, you know, recommended that people do to sort of keep aligned with um, with the God that, you know, we claim to follow. Yeah. Um, Sally Cassidy, would you like to chime in? See if we can get you unmuted. Sally, are you able to unmute yourself? We can't hear you yet. I, I don't know if that's going to work, but Sally, if uh, if we, we can get you, if you can get unmuted, go ahead and speak up and I'll pause and we'll um, circle back around. Is there anybody, any other comments before we move on from this? Yeah, Becky. So this is so obvious, but um, for me, it was when, and if I understood right, the chaplain at the end of the story was a slave himself. Mm -hmm. To be a slave 
I'm even going to tear up a little bit thinking about it, to be a slave and look at a room of slaves and say, you are not a slave, you are a child of God. To me, that's a mystic. And that yeah. they're able to, in their bodily experience, see others as children of God with the light of God in them mm -hmm. in a more transcendent way. And, um, and, and just to say how this ties to Sari's sermon and a call to look at our vulnerability as a way to enter the kingdom of God seems to me to be directly tied to this ability to see what maybe hurts the most and is the most vulnerable as being that which is held most closely in God's heart. Right, right. That which um, binds us to one another. Yeah, absolutely. Sally, it looks like you are unmuted now. Would you like to share with us? Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, uh, these buttons are kind of misleading. I'm sorry, I'm a West Virginia hillbilly. Uh, but I'm not stupid. But I could not follow Sarah Reynolds' discussion, the first one. I, I didn't even try the last time. I just mentioned that because that's my situation. I'm going to keep trying. But it's as if St. John's is talking some esoteric language that I have not learned. That's all. That's all I have to say. Thank you. Well, I mean, it's great. For, thank you for sharing. Thank you for being here with us, nevertheless. Um, <laughs> and I'm, I'm sorry that you're struggling to understand me. I'll see what I can, what I can do about that. Thank you, Sally. Please go ahead. Um. I just had a, a general question that the last questioner mentioned about slavery. Um, we're new to St. John's, and I'm wondering if there's been much discussion about understanding our own history with with um, descendants of descendants of slaves or slave owners. I assume that there was, but I'm just. Yeah, yeah, that's a great question, and I'm so glad you asked it, especially as a newcomer to the community. You're hearing a lot of laughter because, yes, we have had um, a very long process as a church and the last vestry of sort of examining ourselves and our own micro history as a church community um, in terms of the, you know, our racial history and the, the, you know, history of race and racism um, in our surrounding community. And you'll find on our website, actually, the uh, statement on race and equity that the vestry um, put out. Um, after a you know a, a months long um, process of having these conversations um, that yeah that we actually finally put out and passed and it's on our uh, website so I hope you'll go check it out um, so you can sort of see where we're coming from and where we've been and how we're trying to hold ourselves accountable yeah thank you. I thought the most interesting was at the end when he said he could tolerate violence mm -hmm. at any cost because they had had so much. And I thought being a forerunner to Martin Luther King and how much violence all of them tolerated, yeah. you know, with hosing, I just, I thought that piece was interesting. Yeah. Kind of helped me too with, I, I never really understood how God could let his son be crucified because I could never let my son, I don't think, be on a cross and undo all that. But if you were thinking that you can go above the violence piece to a higher level, that's that's kind of helpful to me. Yeah. And uh, to tolerate it, so to speak, in right. that name. Yeah. Thank you. Absolutely. I think we're going to see a little bit more about that as we move a little further into this discussion. But you can absolutely see, can't you? his influence on the shape that the civil rights movement took, right? And the uh, emphasis on nonviolence. Um, and I think that, you know, we sort of see his mysticism at work there too, right? The ability to sort of transcend the realities of life in the world, the really violent, repressive realities that he was living with, right? Um, to say, to call all of us to a higher, you know, a higher uh, standard. It's remarkable. So as a professor 
at Morehouse, Spelman, Howard, Boston. Uh, Thurman was really focused on helping students realize their particular personal potential, asking questions like, who are you really? Who do you want to be, right? Um, so um, sort of, um, you know, in the idea, right, that that your your uh, the realities of your life need not um, be the thing that keep you from becoming who you actually are as a child of God, who you understand yourself to want to become as a child of God. You might be you might be familiar with this. Probably his most famous quote. It's certainly my favorite quote of his. Uh, about vocation. He says, don't ask what the world needs, ask what makes you come alive and go do it because what the world needs is more people who have come alive. And so I think that, you know, he definitely, he certainly lived by that. And you, and you see that reflected too, right? In these questions that he posed as a professor, who are you really? Do that, you know? That's what's going to serve the world is if you can find your deepest, truest self and let that flower. So he under so in keeping, right? He understood self-actualization as this holy endeavor, a holy discipline, um, and one that was entirely necessary to help make the kingdom of God on earth. That you start at home, right? With who you truly are. His mysticism was perhaps unlike others, which is why I was careful, Jenny, with your question. Um, his mysticism was a really practical one. It was really grounded in the world. Um, it was uh, grounded, um, and, it, and it grounded his work, right? He had this sort of um, conviction that all of life is alive, and there's creative intelligence in everything that is. Um, the uh, process theology, process theologians have begun to adopt Howard Thurman's thought recently because of this sort of, um, you might even call it panentheism, right? This idea that God is alive in everything, everything in creation, every one of us, that there is this sort of, um, you know, God light in all of us. And that is to be um, respected, but also to be nourished and fostered. He writes, the mystic's concern with the imperative for social action is not merely to feed the hungry, not merely to relieve human suffering and human misery. If this were all in and of itself, it would be important, surely. But the basic consideration has to do with the removal of all that prevents God from coming to the fullness of life in the individual. Whatever there is that blocks this calls for action. So he really was at bottom fundamentally concerned with how the individual can feel their full belovedness and and feel and become aligned with the God who is their foundation. Any questions or comments before we move on? Okay. He did take a fair amount of criticism for the way that he was involved or lack thereof, according to critics in the civil rights movement, he wasn't a marcher, he wasn't a demonstrator, he wasn't an activist in the traditional sense that we think about it, um, but he was a thought leader and a mentor. And um, it was his thinking, his theology, his understanding of who God is and what God calls us to that sort of helped to form the, the theological, the spiritual foundation for the civil rights movement. Um, and, and not merely because of how much it influenced Dr. King. <laughs> I found this quote in a, um, uh, the, a transcript of a podcast where he was being discussed. The quote was, we thought he would become the Moses of our people, but now he's gone into this mystical stuff, which was, you know, to give sort of shape to um, the, the nature of the sort of criticism that he faced um, from some of his contemporaries in the movement. But in keeping with his, you know, ask what makes you alive and go do it. He believed that social change had to be rooted in personal transformation and spiritual transformation first, right? Um, and so, as I was mentioning, I think in response to your question earlier, Tom, 
um, he really encouraged the the leaders and the clergy uh, um, that were you know active and leading the civil rights movement to stay rooted in these spiritual disciplines, right? Meditation and prayer, worship, singing, silence, um, to to go and you know refill their own vessel as much as possible because we're talking about a long he knew that it was going to be a long and hard and uphill battle right he says this is going to be the most important thing that you need to do in order to keep doing this really important work on behalf of those people that they're that they were leading but it is worth noting that it's kind of an unusual note to strike um in this sort of hyper activist you know period in the culture right we need to go and agitate. We need to move. We need to strike. We need to um, demonstrate and march. And he was saying, um, yeah, do all of those things, but also take the time to quiet your mind and your soul and find that, you know, that those still and quiet moments with God so you can come back into alignment and be strengthened and filled up in order to go and, you know, go and go out and make a difference in the world. So it was his mysticism um, that that was that motivated his uh, action or his activism. Um, like I said, wanted every person to know the experience of wholeness given by God um, that you know we saw was so important to his grandmother as a slave, and that was the gift that she gave him that he continued to pass on. He writes, "Social action, therefore, is an expression of resistance against whatever." separates one from the experience of God, who is the ground of his being. And then again, for the mystic, social action is sacramental, is sacramental, uh, because it is not an end in itself, right? So the aim, of course, is to rectify this sort of alienation from our deepest selves, right? And God is the foundation of that self, um, regardless of, of where you find yourself um, on the social hierarchy or um, in culture. Any questions or comments here before we keep going? Thank you, Margaret. <laughs> um, I would just say that I think his approach had a huge impact on the civil rights movement by encouraging all the leaders. And it was a Christian civil rights movement to be that way because then they inspired all the people um, two years ago, I guess it was on Martin Luther King Jr., my husband and I, uh, weekend, we watched this documentary about Martin Luther King, which was very powerful because they showed live footage, live mm -hmm. footage of what really happened in Selma, in Montgomery. And, and what you see is you just see hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of middle class black people just going, going out into the streets, knowing, knowing because they could be um, attacked by dogs. They could be dragged to jail, and they all knew that. But it was their faith. They had this tremendous faith in God, and I think their leaders, inspired by Thurman, really helped them to feel that, you know, that trust that yeah. no matter what happens to me, if I'm beaten or if I'm hosed or I'm bitten, <laughs> that I'm a child of God. So, right. I, anyway, that's my comment. Thank you. Yeah, you know, and when you put it in context like that, um, it is. Uh, so admirable right and it feels like such a holy response and it also feels like such a high bar right um when you when you're thinking about um the dogs right when you're thinking about what a lot of these people were going through uh in in the struggle for civil rights um it feels like an awfully high bar you know he was really calling all of us to um to something higher right um Ginny, hang on just a second. Let me, oh, you're unmuted. Go ahead. Um, I, I just wanted to comment that I believe this is all based also in nonviolence. Yes. And, and there's no way you can believe in everyone being part of God, um, having God as part of them and respond violently. And mm -hmm. as the former speaker mentioned, just what they faced, it's just so difficult to imagine not wanting to um, defend yourself. I mean, so much of 
our culture in this country is to protect yourself. And you kind of have to let go of that sense um, in order to um, follow this belief. Yeah, I think that's absolutely right. I think that's absolutely right, Ginny. Um, he, uh, he he took the, the nonviolence sort of thread um, from Gandhi and matched it with this sort of, you know, deep spiritual conviction um, that we, all of us, are children of God. Um, and I think that, thank you for connecting the dots um, for us in that way, Jenny. It, that's exactly right. If you believe that the person in front of you is also a child of God, it is awfully hard to convince yourself that it's okay to do violence to them, right? Uh, no matter what. Don't you love this? I like this picture of him a lot. A smile. <laughs> um, we might also think of his mysticism as particularly pastoral, right? And that he was he was most concerned with this question of spiritual wholeness, um, self regard as beloved of God. And so we might think of the pastoral as sort of soothing, uh, soothing the restlessness of the soul, right? And it's sort of a, a shorthand way to describe what we're talking about when we're talking about pastoring, right? What is pastoral? We have this idea of soothing the restlessness of the soul. Um, but then he was also uh, criticized because he was not being activist. And we, we might think of activism as sort of drumming up a restlessness against injustice in the world, a restlessness, you know, of action, right? And so I, th you know, the art, my question for the group is what do you think? Do you think mysticism and or the pastoral and activism are at odds with one another or not? That's certainly one of the criticisms that he faced. Yeah, Tom, please come to the microphone. Thank you. I would say uh, the trap of activism from a Howard Thurman perspective, would be if it leads you into the feeling that without knowing it, you're denying that the other is a child of God. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That is that, and then my guess is that's why he stayed out of it because it is so easy in activism to suddenly turn the other into something evil, right? Something to be hated rather than something to be loved, and and you have to love them in a way that they understand. Mm. not in the way you understand right and that is the challenge that is that's always the challenge yeah yeah thank you absolutely it's such a um uh yeah really can run the risk of uh, dehumanizing the other in activism if you're not staying grounded in exactly in this sort of um conviction that we are all children of god yeah yeah nancy So two comments. Um, one is, you know, I think it's uh, useful to note that um, people who were involved in the activism of this era, many of them went through extensive training mm -hmm. on how not to respond to the violence. Right. The, the kids who sat at the lunch counter, you know, they had, and, you know, people were bombarding them. They had weeks and weeks and weeks of training on how to manage their own feelings and whatever. The other thing I want to say is this morning I was listening to NPR and Hidden Brain, um, one of the shows they have, but it's also on podcast, had a whole, had an expert on how you, how we tend to look at the other um, and, and, dif and separate them from humanity and reality. And it's a very interesting segment that kind of goes with this. So I just nice. commend it to people. Thank you, Nancy. Yeah, Janet. So I think what's really interesting about Thurman's approach is that in many ways, he reflects what I see as the tension in the church today between those for whom the spiritual practices, that church provides that location, mm -hmm. the, the inspiration, the motivation, and it's really, really important worship and the things around that. And then the activism, which most of us are called to do in some fashion, but not necessarily in the same way. And so we spend a lot of time trying to figure out how much of our resources are dedicated to what we do internally and how much 
externally. And I see what he's talking about here is, is really being implicating that this is the greatest challenge that we continue to face, even if yeah. the world has changed a little bit. Right. Yeah. Thank you. I, I love that connection to right here at home. I think that he would say that they're two sides of the same coin, right? That they're not ultimately separable, that they are both um, equally crucial parts of the life of discipleship. And like you said, you know, people's activism takes different forms and his certainly took a different form than a lot of his contemporaries. Um, but yeah, I, I think that he definitely saw, saw his mode of activism as, as entirely rooted in, um, uh, yeah, in this sort of, you know, spiritual mysticism that he practiced. Jenny, go ahead. Um, I, th I think it might be good also to note his age at that time. He would have been in his 60s. Mm -hmm. And I think, um, I, I personally think uh, what you mentioned before about we each have our own different ways of responding to things. And I think that uh, there are times where you also have to take into consideration uh, your physical capabilities along with your spiritual capabilities. And um, I just think it's important to remember his age at the time that all the, the um, demonstrations were going on. Excellent point. Yep. Thank you, Jenny. Um, yeah, he might say one can gain the whole world but lose one's soul, right? It can be caught up in in um, all of these things, consumerism, power, entitlement, self-gratification. Um, and so he was concerned about the oppressor as much as he was concerned about the oppressed, both child, children of God, um, because as we are familiar, uh, we have heard from King, right? The oppression, all of these, all of these systems of injustice stunt people on both sides of the equation. We all know this quote from King probably, we must all learn to live together as brothers or we will all perish together as fools. We are tied together in a single garment of destiny caught in an inescapable network of mutuality. Um, Howard Thurman certainly believed that, right? And I think it was from him that King um, really absorbed this understanding that um, whether the oppressor or the oppressed, both people on both sides of that system, of that equation, um, are spiritually stunted um, by not feeling their own and the person in front of them's full humanity um, and dignity. Right. And so it was through through all of this work that that he really showed us that mysticism can be grounded in this world, right? Affirming of this life and connected to our human struggles um, and that it doesn't necessarily have to be only about spiritual detachment and transcendence, right? His uh, mysticism sought social transformation through seeking healing for both sides of that equation, right? For the oppressed and for the oppressor. Um, if you have read Howard Thurman, as many of you raised your hands uh, before, you, it's probably this book you've read. Has anybody, raise your hand again if you've read this particular book. Yeah, good, about half of us probably. Jesus and the Disinherited was published in 1949 and became the intellectual pillar really of the burgeoning civil rights movement. The very slim volume, if you haven't read it, it's a very easy read, but if it's a good entry point to getting acquainted with his thinking. Um, Although in white Christian circles, it's only started to become, you know, to be read really in the last couple of decades or so. But it's, it's centered around this central animating question. What does the religion of Jesus have to offer those with their backs against the wall? And um, his answer, of course, was that it offered, um, it offered exactly to those with their backs against the wall what it offered to everyone. Right, that the religion of Jesus calls us to this ethic of love that binds us to one another, right? And which was and still is a radical ethic of love, right? To to um, to live by this uh, this thing that that calls us to something greater than ourselves, that calls us to transcend our differences, 
um, he said is, what can unstick us from these systems of oppression? Um, so from his own Christian mystical point of view, it was the religion of Jesus that was going to help those with their backs against the wall and that in so doing would also free the oppressors from those systems of oppression in the way that that um, we can sort of get bound up in these systems that we think serve us, but uh, don't ultimately, right? The religion of Jesus, this is a quote, the religion of Jesus says to the disinherited, love your enemy, take the initiative in seeking ways by which you can have the experience of a common sharing of mutual worth and value. It may be hazardous, but you must do it. For the Negro, it means that he must see the individual white man in the context of a common humanity. You can definitely hear echoes of Dr. King there too. A little bit more about this book. He has chapters on fear, deception, and hate as the three sort of hounds of hell. And he allows that they are very uh, understandable responses to oppression, to the experience of oppression, um, but ultimately disavows them as insufficient um, anyway. But he says that each hound, so to speak, can be tamed and trained and put to use as a tool of survival. They are on some level um, uh, productive. Fear can focus the mind, can train the body to avoid danger. Deception can keep the oppressor dark as to the real feelings or motivations or intentions of the oppressed so that they might get free or improve their situation in some way. Hatred can steal the resolve of those who are living under the experience of oppression. Um, so he understands why these sort of coping mechanisms um, come about, right? And he understands, um, you know, uh, that they are reasonable responses to the, to the experience, but he says that finally that they come at too high a price, right? The price of one's own soul, one's own humanity, and, and perhaps even the price of one's own relationship with God. So we might consider this too high a bar that Thurman sets for those with their backs against the wall. Certainly some of the black activists on the other end of the spectrum, if we wanna call it that, although I'd caution us from doing that. Um, but you know, we think of Malcolm X, think of the Black Panther Party and others on the sort of black power movement side of the struggle for civil rights. They would have said, no, that's too high a price to pay. Um, so what do you think? What do you think of the expectation that we that Thurman had that to expect the pre, the oppressed to take the high ground amid all these forces that grind life down? Is it fair? Is it unfair but necessary? Um, any thoughts about this idea that we're that, that Thurman is calling um, the oppressed in particular to what is really quite a high standard of behavior and of sort of moral comport. Carolyn. Uh, yeah, just a brief comment. I, I think the it, it's necessary to involve a larger community when one is oppressed to have the ability to move forward without the money, the power, the connections mm -hmm. is even harder. So I think to bring in those that have money, commitment, power, connections would be so important. So it's bringing in the community, the larger community. To do it alone is Herculean and yeah. almost impossible, it seems. So it sounds to me like you are making the practical argument for this, that um, keeping these connections in, um, in community and, and building these connections in community is, a ne is necessary on a practical basis in order to sort of dismantle these systems. It makes the uphill pressure. battle easier anyway. Right. I mean, I'm, yeah. I'm thinking Margaret was saying next, sitting next to me saying, you know, um, what about the white police? Mm -hmm. How do we love the white police when you're being oppressed so badly and hurt and killed? Right. Um, it's, it's a high ground. So if there's a way to do it in community somehow. Right, right. Thank you. Yeah. Like, good question. Real struggle, right? 
Um, I think Jenny has her hand up. Go ahead, Jenny. It, it's the turn the other cheek of Jesus. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. We can uh, boil it down real simply that Jesus told us to turn the other cheek. Becky, yeah, come on up to the microphone, if you would. So this is also interesting, right? But this is what I was thinking even a little while ago when, when um, I don't remember who brought it up, but this visual, whether it was um, Gandhi marching with like thousands of people into British troops and getting slaughtered, or whether it's the civil rights movement. All I know visually is that my experience of seeing that is that the power is rooted in those in community walking for and towards something. Mm. And every time I see the violence and the hatred and the acting out of wanting to annihilate, that I, I feel both horror and this deep sympathy because our empathy or something of like, for them too, where is salvation and freedom to choose a different way of being? Yeah. And so back to this question, isn't this the mystic's vision that it's always and both are necessary? We struggle with that today of choosing, do we work for justice and freedom within the system? Because as Carolyn was saying, there's money and power and access to those that can make decisions. Mm -hmm. And do we also rise up as a community as one to speak God's truth mm -hmm. on a grounded base? Yeah. Because visually, to me, the power lies there. Mm. Really well said. Thank you, Becky. Tom, do you have a comment? Okay. Anybody else? All right. Um, here's a quote from him that I just wanted to share with you on Christianity and race. He writes, if being Christian does not demand that all Christians love each other and thereby become deeply engaged in experiencing themselves as human beings, it would seem futile to expect that Christians as Christians would be concerned about the secular community in its gross practices of prejudice and discrimination. If a black Christian and a white Christian in encounter cannot reach out to each other in mutual realization because of that which they are experiencing in common, then there should be no surprise that the Christian institution has been powerless in the presence of the color bar in society. Rather, it has reflected the presence of the color bar within its own institutional life. We might say that that is still largely true, right? On the other hand, if Christians practice brotherhood among Christians, this would be one limited step in the direction of a new order among men. He really did think that this sort of mystical spirituality was the balm that could, that could heal our wounds, right? Think of what this would mean. Wherever one Christian met or dealt with another Christian, there would be a socially redemptive encounter. Indeed, then the Christian would be 11 at all levels of community and in public and private living. So um, I welcome your thoughts. We have about 10 more minutes or just shy of um, for questions, discussion, musings, wonderings, whatever you want to throw out there on Howard Thurman and his thought and influence. Tom, please. So I'm not so sure how to, I don't, I don't think I can offer anything about how you deal with the oppressor with the club or the dog ready to attack. Mm -hmm. um, I'll put that to the side uh, if you allow me. But I think there's a, as Episcopalians, we have this idea that's so beautiful that um, we allow each of us to understand the teachings, the dogma, the, the articles of the confession in ways in which we all explore the mystery, its mystery in our own ways. But I've learned that we also think we understand what it means, uh, but we find that 
if you're the only one thinking that, you probably can't say it's the Episcopal Church's view, right? There's got, you know, so we have to talk about it. Right. And that's always a dynamic thing. I think we need to find a way to talk with the other Christians, mm. the other Muslims, and realize that just because the way we understand the faith doesn't mean that's the only way. Right. That they have principled ways of, of thinking about it. And we need to help discover this together. We need to find a new understanding that we share. And the mysticism opens you up. Right. Because Malcolm X changed mm -hmm. when he went on the Hajj mm -hmm. and he's at Mecca. And he, he realized, oh, you know, black, white, Arab, you know, Asian, they were all one. Right. And he changed. Yeah. The mystical experience changed him. And it opened him up to a broader conversation. Right. I think... So dealing with the person with the club, dealing with the person with the dog in your face, I don't know. I would probably run. But um, but maybe with the evangelical or the right of center Episcopalian, we should be talking. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Right. I love that. Thank you for... Um... <laughs> Yeah, for bringing it back to myth, the the that sort of mystical transcendence um, of difference that is what allows us to enter into sort of the vulnerability of these spaces to say, you know, um, our divisions are not what define us, right? It is our uh, the fact that we are both held by the same God. It also helps us to not think there's only one answer. We right. The possibility that we didn't right. Together. Right. Right. Absolutely. Absolutely. Beautiful. Thank you, Tom. Anybody else want to weigh in? I want to thank Tom for for that message. Um, and I through this whole session today, I've just been thinking about Gaza. Mm -hmm and and israel and how you know i work with an organization that tries to bring israelis and palestinians together and it's really hard right now um but there are people uh, in fact some of the alums of this organization who have started to work on a plan for post hmm. post peace um and you know i just want to keep in mind the point that tom made is that this exists in many faiths and in human humanity that we need to find ways to bridge amidst huge pain, um, huge anger. Um, you know, how do you move forward with that when you've, you know, you're a Gazan or you're an Israeli who was affected by October 7th right. and, and get, you know, move it all forward. It's really hard, but it's, it's more universal than just Christian. So. Right, right, right. Although, um, absolutely it's more universal than just Christian, but I would say that deep spiritual roots, um, and uh, not necessarily religious, right? But deep spiritual roots are essential, right? To that sort of um, being able to sort of look above the horizon, right? And, and, and plan for something else and sort of look beyond the divisions and say, how can we reach out across these lines and join hands together and recognize uh, one another's common humanity? Thank you, Nancy. Any other comments? Questions, wonderings? Sharon, are you coming over to the mic? Awesome, thank you. Um, two comments, I'll try to be fairly brief. First, thank you so much for this presentation. It's helped me understand Thurman better. My initial reaction um, when reading him as part of a sacred ground circle, reading Jesus and the Disinherited was that I thought, why is this useful to say, to, to focus on enduring the pain? You know, my, I guess, activating force in life is concern for the poor, the oppressed. And that just really hit me wrong. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so this is helpful um, because I'm growing in my understanding that it, it needs this spiritual, the Christian foundation of love, um, or else it will be done in ways that are harmful. Um, I also want to put in a plug. Um, I'm getting involved in the Poor People's Campaign and on March 2nd, um, we're get, rallying in Annapolis. Um, we're gathering. It's a, a movement that's bringing together um, 
poor and low wage workers from around the country to their state capitals, along with allies like us who want to see change, who want to see the prioritization of the needs and, um, and the needs of the poor and the low wage workers in policy. And um, so we're going to take a group from St. John's. If you look in Crossroads, I think there was an article again this past week. Um, and we'll probably have, again, how you can sign up to be part of a carpool and go. It's uh, Saturday, March 2nd from 11 to 2. Uh, we'll leave earlier than that to get there. But um, I hope you guys can join us. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you for that, Sharon. And if you haven't read it, um, Jesus and the, Her and the Disinherited, very slim, very accessible. Or if you have or you're looking for something else, I can recommend Meditations of the Heart. If you just want little like spiritual bite-sized tidbits, that's a great book of his to pick up. Thank you for being here, everyone. Um, yes. Yeah. Thank you so much, that was great. Just because um, we have the opportunity, I want to mention two things. Sarah referenced the statement that we worked on for almost over a year at St. John's, which we're now trying to live into our commitment to fighting racial injustice. If you ha don't have a copy of it, we'll leave some here on the table. Awesome. And then uh, Sharon just mentioned that she first That'd be great. <laughs> And Sharon just mentioned that she first encountered Howard Thurman, as I did, in the Sacred Ground course, which is the Episcopal Church's uh, anti-racism curriculum. It teaches us about the history of discrimination, not just against Blacks, but also against other groups in American society. Many of us found that, uh, that uh, experience to be really transformative. We'll be offering our fifth Sacred Ground Circle. We've done four circles. They meet weekly for an hour and a half. There'll be an article in this week's Crossroads. If you're interested, it tells you how to indicate your interest and sign up. It'll be held on Wednesday evening, mm -hmm. 7 to 8.30, and Sarah Reynolds will be part of that circle. So I encourage you, if you haven't taken Sacred Ground, to take it. How many people here have taken Sacred Ground? Wow, look at this. This is great. So you can ask any one of them what the experience was like. Awesome. Okay? Thank you so Thank much, you. Anne. Thank you all for being here, both online and in the room. Happy Sunday, everybody. <laughs>